we decided that the best way to bridge the gap between what investors needed to see and what companies were disclosing was to focus on that aspect of disclosure and try to increase disclosure by borrowers. Hello, I'm ESG Clarity Deputy Editor Natasha Turner, and today I'm speaking with Sabrina Fox, CEO of the European Leveraged Finance Association. It's great to have you with us today, Sabrina. Thank you for having me. So at the end of January, the ELFA and the PRI published fact sheets to help borrowers with ESG disclosures. What led to this decision and what has the reception been so far? So in June of 2019, we formed our ESG committee to think about how we could contribute to the growth of ESG investing in the leveraged finance market. And in order to determine the best path forward, we did an investor survey in November of 2019 to ask investors both in the ELFA and outside in the broader market what their experience was with ESG, what challenges they were facing, uh, what opportunities there were. And what we found was that 70% of respondents were already assessing ESG as part of their investment process on at least half of their fixed income assets. Almost half reported not receiving enough information about ESG factors affecting a borrower's creditworthiness in order to carry out their own ESG analysis. So because our mission focuses on transparency, disclosure, and engagement as the foundational pillars of our approach, we decided that the best way to bridge the gap between what investors needed to see and what companies were disclosing was to focus on that aspect of disclosure and try to increase disclosure by borrowers. And we were also finding from you know the responses the engagement that we had with banks and private equity sponsors as well, they were receiving increasing numbers of investor questionnaires on an individual basis at the end of a deal process when they were in the marketing stage, which is not the ideal time to get questions that might require you know, due diligence or uh, engagement with the company um, and company representatives. So we decided to focus on, on the disclosure aspect of the project. We partnered with the PRI and in publishing the, app and the fact sheets uh, in January, which is the culminate been the culmination of many months uh, of the process and, and workshops with companies and credit analysts on a sector level basis. We've had hugely positive feedback. We've had companies come back and tell us that they really appreciate knowing what investors are looking to see. It helps them to focus their resource in their data collection. It helps them to focus their story about ESG and how they articulate that to investors. And it could, over time, we think, open up new pools of capital for companies to access as they are, you know, get better at, at uh, understanding and growing, developing and articulating their own ESG journey. And since publishing the fact sheets, uh, you've had a, a recent virtual workshop. Uh, around them. What were the main takeaways from this? So this was the second workshop that we've hosted with the PRI and the workshops are designed to bring together companies who are operating in sectors and credit analysts or sector specialists to get a meeting of the minds on some of the ESG topics which are important for that sector. Uh, what we got in terms of feedback from the most recent workshop is that there's a real focus on diversity and inclusion at, at the company level and that that is across sectors. Companies are increasingly being asked for diversity information. The availability of that data varies uh, drastically jurisdiction to jurisdiction. In the last workshop, we managed to um, have as well engagement by U.S. companies. The approach and availability of data in the U.S. is very different to how that you know that looks in Europe. Uh, so that was a really interesting takeaway from uh, from from the event. And companies are increasingly setting targets in this area as well, and are really able to see the tangible benefits of an increase in diversity and inclusiveness within their own organizations. There was a lot of focus on qualitative versus qual qual quantitative information and KPIs and, and trying to really you know, dig into the information of the companies and talk about how to focus on, on aspects of information which are comparable across different companies and potentially even across different sectors. For some information that's not achievable, that qualitative information is going to be a focus at least for some time and potentially on an ongoing basis. So companies were able to discuss with investors how to articulate that qualitative information, what aspects of that information they should be highlighting, um, and there was a real rich engagement on that topic. 
Uh, supply chain diligence was also very much top of the list. There's a lot of focus on supply chain disclosure and important for companies to disclose conditions relating to offshore and outsourcing services and the interaction between their permanent workforce and uh, their contracting force and whether there's sufficient whistleblowing, money laundering, and bribery training going all the way down into that supply chain, as these risks, both on a reputational perspective and also very much from a business perspective, become front and center for companies um, from the perspective of supply chain. Uh, and then one that was really, you know, sort of self-confirming in, in the, well, the work that we've been doing was that consistency in reporting is really needed. It's something that the market is crying out for, that companies appreciate receiving information about what they should be focused on that helps them, as I said before, to, to allocate resource effectively. And, and they are very supportive of the work that we're doing and, and appreciate having some guidance from investors in leverage finance on what are the credit relevant ESG topics that they should be focusing on. And you've mentioned there diversity and inclusion and supply chains. Are those the things that you think are going to dominate the ESG space more broadly this year or are there some other things you can mention? Where a lot of exciting uh, developments are going to emerge is in the ESG margin ratchet area in the sort of contractual provisions which which are emerging in the leveraged finance space. Um, there's, you know, it's one thing to collect, to, you know, ask for the data, collect the data. Once you do that, you unlock a whole range of possibilities that, you know, creative professionals in the banking and private equity space can work with their companies to tell a story, to articulate value at the bottom line of a company to, you know, reduce credit risk and potentially for some companies to to reduce interest expense if they can craft a you know properly gauged to the company fundamentals and you know business plan uh you know esg margin ratchet it has been done in a few deals already um both in the leveraged finance space and bonds and also in a unitranche deal um that was done by bearings last year so it's something i think will emerge as as one of the key themes this year uh in the in the esg space for leveraged finance borrowers as they look to really create creatively deploy some of the information that they've started to collect with their advisors. And in fact, we together with the ESG fact sheets, we also produced a guide which was drafted by a working group of senior legal and sell side professionals on how to deploy the ESG fact sheets in a deal in a leveraged finance market and with ongoing company reporting. Ultimately, that's where we want to get to. We want to get the information from the fact sheet into the hands of investors. And the fifth chapter in that guide is on contractual provisions. Now, initially that's the shortest chapter because up to now it is the most shifting space. It is the most evolving space, but it's evolving really quickly. And I think over time, as we update the guide and we include information about the experiences that practitioners are having on the front lines, that that will end up being one of the longest, most vibrant chapters because it's a space that I think is going to evolve and really you know, create lots of opportunities for, for companies going forward. Great, I look forward to that. And what are the next steps to achieving more robust ESG disclosures? Strong engagement with advisors to companies is a big priority for us this year. We've got very, you know, sort of established process, which, which we modeled on the PRI's workshops and their credit risk and ratings initiative where we get together with companies in sector level basis and we do that in breakout groups on Zoom. It works very well virtually. We did the same thing in kind of adapting that into the leveraged finance space with company advisors in November. And we had law firm partners, sell side, you know, professionals, private equity sponsors, and we got everyone into groups, which also included senior fund managers, and they were able to articulate what information they needed, why they needed it, why it was important. And they really gave the opportunity to these professionals to put their heads together and think about the best ways to disclose that information. So we'll continue to, to engage with those professionals to support and guide the deployment of the ESG fact sheets into company disclosure. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we'll continue to do that through this year. And we'll also be rolling out a additional ESG fact sheet. So we had the, the, the workshop last week that you mentioned, which added five more sectors to the ESG fact sheet series, which will be published in probably six weeks. I, I'm probably going to get my hands slapped by someone by putting a time on it, but I think that's sort of what we're aiming for. And then we're looking to do additional uh, workshops with more companies and other sectors so that we can build out the range and be you know truly reflective of, of the, the diverse 
for, you know, profile of companies that operate in the leveraged finance market? Just finally then uh, a slightly different um, uh, question, I suppose. So you became uh, CEO uh, just in January. Um, how has that been and what are your plans for the ELFA this year and beyond? So we spent the first two years of our inception since January 2019 building the organization into a credible counterparty to act as a voice for investors in the leveraged finance market. And we really achieved that. So I start as CEO of the organization with a very solid foundation from which to achieve the goals of our members, which ultimately is what our organization exists to do. So we're looking to deepen our engagement with regulators. And during the sort of height of the volatility in March and April, as a result of the pandemic, we had some very productive discussions with regulators to ensure that they knew what was happening on the front lines, that they could understand the volatility and how investors were dealing with it. Uh, so that they could best craft their own regulatory approach um, and policy approach to that. We'd like to continue those dialogues with regulators as we move into the, you know, sort of next stages of, uh, you know, how the leveraged finance market is growing and shifting and changing to, to respond to the pandemic and to the challenges of companies going forward. We'll obviously continue to build out our ESG disclosure initiative. Um, we do think that that will create lots of really exciting opportunities for, for companies uh, and their advisors throughout the year, um, we'll be looking to extend the governance pillar of ESG into some of the governance issues in our own market, including to increase covenant transparency and disclosure on capacity under covenants for leveraged finance borrowers. Covenants have seen a huge you know, growth and evolution. They've become lots more complicated, lots more innovative. We believe that disclosure should evolve along with that. So we'll be lobbying for clear disclosure, greater transparency in that area as well. And then as ever, our mission is to serve our, our members and, and the wider market to create a deeper, you know, more resilient, strong leverage finance market. We'll continue to do that, we'll continue, you know, rolling out more benefits for our members, building our membership, uh, educating the market and, and really acting as a sounding board for the investor voice uh, in, in European leverage finance. That's the plan. Brilliant. Well, all the best of luck. And thanks for speaking with us today, Sabrina. Thank you very much for having me.